No valet, no nanny, even. It's 1927. We're modern folk. Blimey. The king and queen are coming to Downton. What? I want every surface to gleam and sparkle. A royal luncheon, a parade, and a dinner. I'm going to have to sit down. How's it all going? Mary's got it under control. Hardly. I need your help, Carson. I'll be there in the morning, my lady. Don't you worry. Should we really go on with it? You mean, leave Downton? Downton Abbey's the heart of this community, and you're keeping it beating. Remember to pray for us. I'll put in a word. Your Majesties, welcome to Downton Abbey. Will you have enough cliches to get you through the visit? If not, I'll come to you. Oh, here we go. Hello, and welcome to episode eight of Chatterbox, the last in our current series. My name is Callum, and I'm an associate artist and alumnus of Playbox Theatre, the company behind Chatterbox. So for those of you new to Chatterbox, this is an ongoing series of conversations with actors and artists from across the industry. Last week, we spoke to Pirates of the Caribbean star Kevin McNally about all things piratical and his time playing King Lear at the Globe Theatre. During the hugely successful first series, we've also spoken to BAFTA, Olivier and Emmy nominated actor Juliet Stevenson, multi award winning Hamlet, Parker Essiedu, and the creators of The Play That Goes Wrong, Charlie Russell and Dave Hearn, amongst many, many others. If you want to catch up on any of the episodes, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. And I'm so pleased to be able to add today's guest to that impressive list. But before we meet them, just a quick reminder that, as always, we want you to get involved in these conversations too. So get those questions coming in. If you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen on a laptop and the top of your screen on a mobile, then you'll find a button that you can click to send questions directly to me. Importantly, you'll be able to see the questions other people have asked and vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. The more votes, the higher they appear in my inbox. And if you like someone else's question, but you want to add an idea or perhaps have a follow-up or related question, you can now comment on other people's questions as well. So have a look at what other people are asking too. And as always, we'll try to get through as many as we can. If you're watching live on YouTube, fear not, though you can't message in questions, you can still get involved by helping to support Chatterbox. Head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash donate. And if you can, give a little to help Playbox Theatre, the incredible company behind Chatterbox, keep going through these choppy waters and to keep making content like this for young people all over the world to enjoy. Now, it's time for me to introduce my special guest. Phyllis Logan needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Phyllis graduated from the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama with the James Bridie Gold Medal in Acting. After graduation, she joined Dundee Rep before beginning an illustrious TV and film career. She won a BAFTA for her performance in the film Another Time, Another Place, She's worked with director and writer Mike Lee on the Palm Door winning, double BAFTA winning, five time Oscar nominated film, Secrets and Lies. And for any Doctor Who fans out there, Phyllis was in the 11th series of the show alongside Jodie Whittaker and her film, Misbehaviour with Kira Knightley, had just been released in cinemas when lockdown took hold. 
And that's not even touching on her stage career. The Hampstead, the Crucible, Theatre Royal Bath, the West End. But she's probably most well known for her role as Mrs. Hughes in the Emmy, Golden Globe and BAFTA award-winning series, Downton Abbey. And I happen to know that she's fluent in Italian as well. Ciao, Fearless. Are you there? Here she comes. Ciao. I'm <laughs> here. I should be here. I, uh, you're just coming onto screen now. I think your camera's just warming up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me, though? I can hear you. Ah, there I am. Oh, there you go. Um, so how are you holding up in isolation, Phyllis? I think you've been quite busy, haven't you? Well, you know, not bad, mostly to do with voice work or a bit, things like this as well. But I've been doing some narration for <clears throat> a very nice series that's about to come out. It's one of these, it's not the Yorkshire vet, it's the Highland vet. But it does what it says on the tin. It's a vet's practice in the north of Scotland, Thurso to be precise. And, um, and they go about their daily chores, um, giving birth to calves, lambs, um, you know, giving the snip to chihuahuas, doing whatever, treating <laughs> an abscess on a corn snake, you know, all manner of things. Anyway, and I'm narrating that. So that's fun to do. So I do that in my little mock-up studio, uh, which is the study. And um, I'm on Skype with the director who's living in Yorkshire. So we, so he directs me through it. Uh, so it's, it's a weird way of working, but it actually seems to seems to be working. So, yeah, that's been keeping me busy. Well, that's good. You've been you've been occupied. Now, I, you know. <laughs> ordinarily, we start by asking a question posed by last week's guest. Ah. Now, we've had questions about the importance of being creative in isolation, about dream roles, self reflection. What do you think last week's guest, your husband Kevin McNally, has asked you? Well, he didn't mention this. <laughs> I've no idea, but I'm sure it's something that I'm going to be stumped by. Oh, uh, well, I hope not for his sake. He says, Phyllis, what time's dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, I have to say, that's been getting me down, the whole cooking nonsense. I mean, I do like to cook, but not incessantly. Um, but it's, as soon as everybody gets up in the morning, it's like what should we have to eat? And then I, well, so it's omelettes or whatever. And then I've got to dream up something that's going to entice all three tastes, my husband, my son, myself. Um, so <laughs> it's getting me down. So we've resorted quite a bit, I have to say, to takeaways, which, you know, I don't mind so much because we're trying to help out our local um uh, restaurants, the ones that are just small, not big chains, but just small independent restaurants who would go to the wall if it weren't for the fact that they're they're opening up for takeaway. So we try and and uh, you know pack. There's no plan tonight. You're having a takeaway tonight. Yes, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, very nice. Like Napoli with anchovies and capers and black olives. Oh, lovely! That sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, look, you and Kevin have been together a long time. To kick off with a very personal question, I know that acting is or can be a temperamental profession. You can be out of work for long periods of time. You can work away from home a lot. I wondered what it's been like sustaining a relationship when you're both actors. Well, Kevin would always say, and, and I sort of concur with this, that because um, he's away quite a bit. And I, you know, have been known to be away quite a bit with my work. but. And he maintains that's what keeps us still married because we don't see each other all that often. <laughs> and when we do, you know, we try to make the best of it. It's difficult at this period of time because, of course, we've never, we've never spent this long together for years, seeing each other all day, every day. Well, what about when you're working together? I, I think Kevin did a few series of Downton with you, didn't he? He did a few episodes. How very dear he! Um, and the, produ the producers didn't even bother asking if I minded, <laughs> <laughs> which I took exception to. No, he just said to me one day, "Oh, I've had an offer of a job," and I said, "Oh yeah, what's that?" He was on the phone to me actually. I was I was filming at the time, Downton Abbey, and he said, "Oh, what's Downton Abbey?" I said, "Oh, very funny. What's the job?" Downton Abbey. 
I said, okay, joke over. I've got to get back soon. Just, what's the job? It's Downton Abbey, he said for the third time, a bit crossly. And um, there he was playing horrible Mr. Bryant. And in fact, in some days when we were both called at the same time, we would get the same car in together. Lovely. What was that like? Was that nice, working with him? Well, it was actually, because in actual fact, the the storyline involved this maid who had been, who'd left under a cloud and she found herself in dire circumstances and all our storylines were connected. So uh, every scene practically that he was in, I was in and vice versa, which is quite unusual. Usually somebody would come in, like in the film, Jim Carter, who plays Mr. Carson, Imelda, his wife was in it. But of course they never actually crossed paths in the, the scenes, as it were. But yeah, I know Kevin and I had all our scenes together, so it was nice. Yeah. And did you work together before? Um, we did an episode of, I don't know, your younger viewers won't remember this, possibly, um, Rab C. Nesbitt. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. My, dad, my dad loves that show. I know. Anyway, very funny show. And Gregor, who plays Rab C., is a good friend of, of, of ours. And um, so <laughs> that was fun, although we never crossed paths in that. But it was a funny premise, the whole thing. And then we've done a couple of short films together and maybe I'm missing something. Do you know something? I don't know. Maybe there's something else major that I've completely forgotten about. <laughs> I'd like to say I was in a pirate movie playing Johnny Depp's mother, even I would go with that. But... <laughs> I well, have. There's another one coming, so you never know. Is um, it? <laughs> well, that's what I heard. Maybe that's not right. Um, I was going to ask. Downton Abbey was written by Oscar winner Julian Fellows. I wondered whether you had any inkling when you said yes to the job that it would turn into such a kind of worldwide phenomenon. Well, to be honest, I don't think anybody, even Julian, you know, by that time. Oscar winning Julian Fellows, the writer, uh, nobody could have predicted that, that, that it would take off just quite in the global way it did. But when I, when I read the script, I thought it was a super, I thought the scripts were fabulous. I thought it just summed up all the characters almost in like one page. You thought, oh, I knew who this person is. And, and it was quite quickly moving along. It wasn't turgid and slow as you might expect from a costume drama where everybody's being very regal and that it was it was quite like a almost like a a soap you know it sort of sped through all the storylines and all the character lines um and I did think of oh, this at that time Maggie Smith I think was attached to it as was Hugh Bonneville I believe and so I thought it was ticking lots of boxes as far as I could see. You know, it was Julian, it was Maggie, it was Think, the script was great. So I thought, this, this has got the potential to be reasonably successful. <laughs> How <laughs> far out I was. Um, yeah. Very, very successful. You mentioned there it ticked lots of boxes for you. We, we had a hmm. question come in from before the show from Germany, actually, somebody in Germany, Melanie. Um, ah. would like Guten Tag, Melanie. <laughs> She'd like to know what criteria you use when choosing roles. Do you know, it's a funny one, and I don't know if you feel the same. It's, I mean, Julian Fellows, for example, is a great storyteller. He's just got a fund of stories in him, and he can, he can put in all his previous experience and make it real and funny and touching at the same time and it's the story is everything really if if you've got a good story then you're more than halfway there um so it if it even was like a a big character that you were playing or who was in every single scene if it wasn't a good story or not a good script you would say no wouldn't you think well yeah, it's a huge big part, but it's it's a daft story, so I don't think I'll bother. <laughs> and so is Downton, has that changed your career at all? Because, I mean, you were a BAFTA winning actor long before Downton, but the, yeah. the reason 
this, this project has been sort of ginormous, hasn't it? And so I, I wondered if it's given you more choice in terms of the parts you can... To, uh, to a certain extent, um, and by the way, the BAFTA, I won that like 100 years ago, back before any of your viewers' parents were even born. <laughs> BAFTA, the BAFTA, Phyllis. BAFTA's a BAFTA. <laughs> OK, I should have brought it up with me, actually. Um, I'm in the top, I'm up the stairs here and trying to keep away from the noise. Um, Yes, I suppose opportunity maybe it has given me a bit more opportunity. I mean, for a time afterwards, I was getting offered um, women of a of the same type as Mrs. Hughes. In fact, I shouldn't say this. I've just been playing for Nick on Nickelodeon, the Scottish housekeeper in um, in a remake of Paddington Bear, the animation. They've got a new one on Nickelodeon and they asked me if I'd been the Scottish housekeeper. But they're such lovely stories. Um, so so I've, I've been playing a Scottish housekeeper again. Um, but yes, your question, to get back to your question. Um, yes, it has given to a certain extent opportunities and the opportunity to travel as well, you know, has been great, you know, when we've been flown everywhere to do promotional thing, mostly in the the states that has been and and yes people are more maybe on people's radar for certain roles where I might not have been in in the past so it definitely has um made a difference in it which is nice for somebody who's in the well not exactly twilight of my career but um <laughs> most of my career is behind me rather than in front of me if you see what I mean so it's nice to be in this position um at my being on people's radars there uh, the other side of that is obviously fandom and I wondered well, like this afternoon for example I watched a five minute montage of your work that someone had set to music in celebration of your birthday that's on YouTube there for you Aww. um I, I, I know when we worked together that Downton fans came to see the show I think one fan has a particular tattoo as well I wondered if, if that was ever sort of daunting or does it just feel like being sort of the head of a little community? Um, well, I have to say here and now, I am not on Twitter or Facebook or anything or Instagram or anything like that, uh, mainly because I, I, I find, you know, too much time taken up just, you know, texting and WhatsApping and replying to emails. You know, I couldn't be doing with all the rest of it. So. Kevin often, because he is on Twitter, often gets messages to pass on to me through the fans. Yes, I know. I should pay him a, a fee or something, you know, because um, you, they know I'm not on Twitter. But it is lovely that, that fans are, are so enthusiastic and they would go to extreme ends uh, to show their enthusiasm. And, and it's quite touching, really, although you know, you can't imagine being quite a reserved Brit that you would be quite so effusive if it were you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also wondered uh, what the process of working on a long-running show like Downton is like. You know, I know for Downton you had sort of two or three directors every series and they would change every few series. Yes, we, we had quite a, we had a core of a, of, a, of a few directors, which was great, so you just got a sense of continuity. But we would work... We'd start maybe February time. We'd finish towards the end of August, going into September. So we'd, it was like six months on, six months off. And then when you had the six months off, you always knew that you were going to go back in February. So you could spend the next six months doing something else or doing nothing, which, you know, uh, depending on if anything cropped up. So it was a, actually a really nice balance because we had the latter end of the summer and then in, and then we started again just as spring was maybe about to spring and um so it was it was an it was a good way of working of course because we all knew each other so well by then you have a shorthand as to you know when you're playing scenes um because we knew each other's work so well we knew that our characters so well so it was, it was a bit too easy in some ways, do you know what I mean? Because you, you do like a challenge um, now and again, which we had our challenge. Well, I certainly did when we did our play together, Switzerland. Um, mm -hmm. That was one thing that I thought, well, I've been too, it's, 
life's been too easy on me that so far I better give myself a bit of a scare so that's why I decided to work with you <laughs> <laughs> well I was going to ask about Switzerland because um in that show you were playing a real person uh Patricia Heiss fortunately so we couldn't be sued <laughs> she wrote the Mr Ripley novels and the, the film that was Carol um I, I wondered if your process was any different when you were knew you were representing somebody real well yes I mean I suppose definitely I wanted to try and capture as much of her essence as I could and so I mean th there is quite a body of, of, of work that we, we could refer to in, in her biog auto not autobiograph biographies that have been written about her and certain snippets so but I mean you could have spent your entire rehearsal, so just reading and reading and reading. So you dipped into bits and pieces. Um, I'm sure you did the same. Or maybe you read them all, did you? All the No, I, the biographies we got were sort of like this thick, weren't they? It was... Well, you were sort of playing a, a, a mythical character, as it were. That's true. I didn't have to do the same length. You didn't have to do the same. So I did felt, I felt I owed it to, to, to her and, and to the piece, to the play, to try and, and, like I say, capture her essence. But to be honest, jo, Joanne Murray-Smith, who wrote the play, it was so well-crafted that you almost didn't need to refer to anything else because it was all there. The meat of it was all there. The character was all there. Um, and, of course, Lucy Bailey did a wonderful job directing it. So... Um, so, and that play, we started at the Eusenhoff Theatre in Bath, which is an auditorium of, of about 150, isn't it? And then we went into the West End where there was sort of about 500 people there. I, I wondered, does a big jump like that in venue size affect your performance? Did you, did you take that into consideration? Well, I mean, to be quite honest, it seemed to be, I mean, it's quite a... The character's quite bold and quite loud, and the piece is, you know, quite like that too. But it seemed to work really well in that small venue with people practically on top of you. And I didn't, I was more frightened about that, to be honest, at the beginning. I thought, oh my, I'm going to see the, the, the whites of these people's eyes, for goodness sake, never mind anything else. Although, unfortunately, I'm quite blind, so... <laughs> um, but then going to the West End, where you've got a proper cross arch and it it felt, re it took a while to get to grips with that, I have to say. A while, I mean, we didn't have that long there. What was it, a couple, two, three months? Two? Oh, yeah. Um, but it did take me a while to adjust to it. I mean, it wasn't so much adjusting to the fact that there are more people you've got to reach the back of the stalls, because I think we're both, we're both quite good at projecting um you were obviously taught well at drama school <laughs> <laughs> well you too of course um so um but it did it it almost it's quite an intimate play in strangely um and it felt so you felt more exposed doing it in front of a big audience on a big stage but yeah now look we've got the questions have been pinging away in my like, there are loads. But before we do that, um, we thought we would bring someone on screen to ask a question, camera to camera, to you. So Rich is going to bring Caitlin onto your screen, hopefully. Wow. Now, Caitlin is a wonderful member of Playbox, the youth theatre behind Chatterbox. She does a huge range of their sessions. She assists in running some of them. And um, if memory serves me correctly, her dad is an animal wrangler for film and TV. Yeah. I think oh! Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin, hi. Hi. Uh, how, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And where are you at home, I presume? Yes, I am at home with the animals. <laughs> oh, you've got lots of animals, have you? Mm-hmm. How many? But yeah, what, I was, kind? <laughs> what kind? Um, mostly invertebrate. Um, we recently oh. got some bees as well, so it's oh, a whole yeah. menagerie. <laughs> bee honey. Oh. Now, Caitlin, what's your question for Phyllis? Yeah, so I was just kind of wondering, as a young woman thinking about working in the film TV industry, you know, there's this perception 
particularly for actors, that women have to look a certain way or have to be, you know, young looking for as long as possible within their career. But one of the things that I love so much about Fountain is ha this wonderful cast of women who are all of different diverse ages and backgrounds. And I was just wondering how you felt about that and if there are certain stereotypes or typecasts that you find that women above a certain age have kind of pushed into in some way or, you know, is it a positive thing, a negative thing? Yes, no, I would agree with you that it, certainly in Downton Abbey we did have a big cross-section of, you know, um, younger women and right up to, to Maggie, who is like the high priestess of the acting <laughs> fraternity and of Downton Abbey too. Um, so it was, it, it was nice to see that diversion of characters and not everybody um, was, you know, catwalk looks or you know figures or anything like that we were all quite sort of normal looking you know with lumps and bumps and whatnot and I I would hope I, I think maybe in the past there was more of an expectation to look a certain way but I would I would like to think that that doesn't apply so much nowadays um that that you know people can look any old way they like or have disabilities and, and still be able to, to work. Um, so I would hope that that would change. And I think your point about having to look younger all the time, well, I haven't made any attempt at that whatsoever. I think, what's the point? Um, <laughs> maybe that's more applicable in America, to be honest, um, in the States and in, in movie land. I think there is a huge pressure on, I mean, some fantastic actresses uh, I know who are still beautiful and aging have resorted to getting work done. And I just think, I can understand why they do it, but I think they shouldn't be pressurised or they shouldn't pressurise themselves to do it and just let the world know, actually, this is what ageing is all about. It's not about Botoxing yourself to death and, you know, having your eyebrows up here and everything. It's it's about, you know, this is me. This is my life all here. You know, my wrinkles, my puffs, my all the rest of it. Um, and it'd be nice to, you know, let the world know that that's what it's all about, not the rest of it. So I don't know if that's answered your question in any way, shape or form. That's an interesting question. Did that answer it, Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. I think your point about America is definitely, like, versus the UK is definitely really interesting. And it's really reassuring to hear someone talk about things moving forward in that kind of way. So, yeah, thank you. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for that question, Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, now, before we take some more, just a quick reminder for anyone watching at home that you can head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash donate if you want to help support Playbox Theatre, the company behind Chatterbox. No donation amount is too small or indeed too large. Um, so, look, let's take some questions from the plethora that have been popping in. So right at the top with loads of votes is from, this is from Alison, who... I happen to know, actually, is from Minnesota in the USA. Um, she is asking, if you could, what advice would you give to your younger self who is just starting out in the acting business? Oh. Do you know, it's funny, and I, I could still give myself this advice too, but um, I don't think... Because when I was young and starting out, it was quite easy then. There was a lot less people in, in the acting profession. And you usually got jobs quite regularly. In the theatre, mostly, it has to be said. But I I suppose I lacked, and still do to some extent, ambition, strangely enough. Um, and when I look... It my past, and there's certain opportunities that perhaps I didn't follow up or I didn't really grab by the. And I think, no, I would have the fun I did and do the jobs I did, but just have that a little bit more drive and a little bit more ambition. I think that's what I tell my younger self. That's great. How interesting. I know. Um, Laura would like to know. 
How do you prepare for film auditions and what helps you get focused for the, in front of the camera? For film auditions? Yes. Right. Well, of course, nowadays, if you do have to do any of that stuff, it's you've got to film yourself. It's a bit of a DIY job. You, you, you go on camera. Um, what I the last one I did, what was that for? But I did learn, I mean, I mean, sometimes they send you screeds like the night before and you're expected to learn it, which is nonsense. You know, I just say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit busy at the minute. Could I send it in on Monday? And so I give myself time to, to know it so that you're not constantly referring to the script. Um, I know some people have, have a way of doing it where they can keep the script on a pad or their iPad or something to the side of the camera and read so it looks like you're looking into camera but you're reading all the time that's possible but it's really hard actually because for the most part you don't get the full script you only get a scene you might get a synopsis but you can't relate it to any other part you've just got this one chunk so you've just got to focus on that not think what my back story is or what my future story is or where I've been and blah 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 you just have to take it you know as it is on the script you just have to do it like that fantastic um and we have one here from Mela who says hello from Berlin we're all over the world today aren't we yeah good tag again um <laughs> Uh, she asked, was Elsie Hughes the only role you auditioned for in Downton, or were you also auditioning for other characters in the show? Uh, no, funnily enough. No, I, I, I wasn't. I was only asked um, for to um, audition for Elsie. Although I wonder who else I could have auditioned for. Maybe, I don't know. Who would you like to have been? Um... <laughs> Maybe gender non-specific as well. There might be a exactly uh, Mr. Mosley, maybe. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aisling would like to know. And apologies if I've just said your name wrong. Ashling. Um, Ashling, that will be it. Very good. She's not even seen it and knows. Um, what <laughs> What was your most bizarre encounter with a Downton fan over the years? Oh, well, this is one of, if there was like a funny story, but anyway, this, yes, I, I was once at a, how long have I got? I'll try and be quick. Um, Kevin, my husband, who was on last week, uh, does sometimes does these comic cons, you know, uh, conventions where people go, it's mostly for sci-fi things, or there's a lot of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean People go in, they all get dressed up in weird and wonderful, you know, you're, you're going up in the lift of the hotel and there's a bunch of stormtroopers comes into the lift beside you and then, and then you've got some sort of weird mummies walking past down the hallway. It's bizarre. And he was doing one of those and he had to go and speak like a Q&A in a hall in one of the hotels. And so I was following, there was a hundreds and hundreds of people going in different directions. And we were all going at snail's pace. And suddenly this couple who were dressed as two characters from Jurassic Park, um, you know, said to me, are you Phyllis Lowe? And I said, yes. And she, she was so over-enthusiastic. I mean, lovely woman, as, actually, as it turns out. And um, she said, oh, at night we get dressed up as Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes. That's our, we've got the wigs, we've got the whole thing. She said, and then she lifted up her shirt and she said, look, and she had a tattoo of the keys that Mrs. We Mrs. Hughes wears on her, her 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 uniform. She's always got her keys tucked into her belt, and she had got those very keys tattooed on her hip. Wow! Which I thought was quite extreme, <laughs> but you know she's very nice, and we had a chat to them. And Kevin's bumped into them many times subsequently at various things, and they're a lovely couple. They're really nice, but. Um, yeah, that was quite... Dedication, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, dedication, yes. Um, Hannah would like to know um, what advice you would give to actors graduating this year who want to work in period drama. Oh, dear. Well, I feel sorry for anybody graduating this year because, of course, it's going to be a bit of a flop to begin with, but let's hope uh, as the year 
progresses, that there will be more productions coming in. Well, what I suggest is you become best friends with Julian Fellows because he seems to be the one doing all the costume dramas around. Um, if that's your thing, although I wouldn't limit yourself to just doing costume drama, um, I don't know what, I mean, I know that um, he's done Belgravia. Um, there are other things. There are other things beside Julian Fellows, I know, but um, he's the main exponent of it at this period in time. I don't know what I would suggest how you would go about it. You need to know of the productions that are going. Um, so that's where an agent would come in and and you just keep need to keep your ear to the ground and the various, uh, you know, websites and whatever is coming out. Don't ask me. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But so I, I, I would I would say don't keep yourself in a box. Just, you know, branch out, be anything, be everything. Very good. Elliot says, he says, hi, this is Elliot. Um, who is your acting idol and who has influenced who influenced you to go into acting? Oh my, um, that's a big question uh, because there's so many wonderful actors around. I, I was always taken by John Hurt, the late John Hurt, who even in, in I mean, he's done a, a load, of, apart from Elephant Man, the usual, the, the most obvious one, but Ten Rillington plays back in the day. You know, he's he's a wonderful actor. And even in quite sort of mediocre pieces of work, not him, I mean, the, the work itself, he would always do something, do some little thing that would absolutely stand out as being just magnificent. He was such a wonderful actor. But as far as, you know, I'm a huge fan of Maggie Smith, of course, and, you know, she is phenomenal. Um, and Dame Judy, all the dames, yes, Penelope Wilton, I've been an admirer of hers for many a year. She's such a wonderful actress and such a lovely, lovely woman as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's endless amounts, but, you know, lots of youngsters these days, you know, these, these days, youngsters. I've talked about Kira Knightley, you know, which was lovely to do that film with her, and she's such a sweetheart. And, of course, I met her when she was about 17 on the, the first Pirates film with Kevin. So oh. we, we, we met her then, and she's as sweet as she ever was, you know, when I did that thing just recently with her. So an admirer of hers too. Very good. Um, Ellis would like to know, was it difficult filming the scenes in the servants' quarters of Downton Abbey? Oh, no, sorry. Let me get that. I've, I've misread that. Was it difficult filming some, the scenes in the servants' quarters and the house of Downton Abbey in separate places? Because uh, the servants' quarters was at um, Ealing Studios, wasn't it? Correct. Except, apart from the film, when we, we went to Ealing Studios, we were a different studio. But... Um, it was quite humorous, actually, because um, I don't know if you noticed, like when, when, the, when the servants come into the main house, they always come through this green baize door, mm -hmm. just up the big entrance hall. There's a green baize door and there's stairs. So, and then in the servants' hall in the studio, there's stairs going up. And then you cut to you know, three weeks later and we come through the bay's door or whatever but we used to have to all troop up pretending we were going upstairs and it was just this tiny little platform with this huge arc lights you know lighting something but there was nowhere to go we were up on top so we would all be huddled we'd all have to be quiet until the scene ended because somebody else might be talking at the bottom of the stairs having a scene so we would all be huddled like this together in this tiny platform <laughs> waiting for somebody to say cut and then oh, yeah, so it was fun, actually, but it wasn't, I think it was maybe more of a headache for the technicals, you know, dealing with continuity and everything so far apart, weeks apart. But no, for us, it was just, no, it wasn't hard. <laughs> um, now, we've had lots of questions come in from Anne, and she sent them in in French. Um, but fortunately, she also sent them in ahead of the, this uh, Chatterbox interview. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, That's great. Oh, Callum, good for you. 
Um, so Anne, she, she, first of all, she wants to praise your work with Dementia UK and other Alzheimer's charities. She says that's an inspiration to many women. Um, her question, she says, in France, uh, she says colleagues are very important because you spend more time with them than you do with your family. She wondered which actors and actresses um, that you have remained close friends with. Oh, well, I mean, I'd like to, I mean, it's funny because, because we did, I, I'm talking about Downton now mostly, and that's maybe what Anne's referring to. Um, yeah, we, we still, we're still in touch, all of us. I mean, some more so than others. Like I'm, I'm in touch a lot with Leslie because we, we're women of a certain age. We live in the same sort of area of London, except she's in Los Angeles at the minute, but um, in little Sophie. Shira, so and Jim, Mr. Carson, you know, we all we have a nice little sort of email exchanges and keep each other amused. Um, and then sometimes we'll we'll do something like um yesterday, for example, we had a a Zoom meeting, there was a whole bunch of us on, Hugh and Elizabeth and Julian, because we'd we'd been won on a on a on an auction by Sotheby's for all the NHS charities, somebody had bid some money to speak to us all on Zoom, have a Zoom meeting with us. Wow. He paid $10,000. Yeah. Um, so, so it was lovely to see us all. There was Hugh and Elizabeth and Alan and, you know, and it, was, it was lovely. And we do keep in touch with various bits and bobs, you know, like things. And when we all get together again and hopefully we might do again who knows oh it's not been it's not been kicked out of the park yet it's not nothing is set i have to say but it would be nice the dream's still there i don't know whether it's going to become a reality but the dream is there to do another one maybe you maybe already answered this question then but anna says in downton abbey the cast is very large and she says, do you prefer working with larger or smaller casts? Well, you know, they both have their um, pluses and minuses. This was great because we we all had such a laugh. Um, and, you know, so many different characters. I don't mean just in the thing, but the actors themselves. Um, we used to have a right old good laugh. But... I mean, like working with you on on that Switzerland, there was the two of us, that was it. We were carrying the whole thing. And that had its appeal as well. So it's lovely to know that it's just the two of you. And you so yeah, and you have more time to work on, I suppose, your character and the piece itself, because it's just two, you're not constantly going off and doing a scene with somebody else. You've got that nice and I'd like to think that we created a nice intimacy in our in our little project. Look, we're still in touch. It must have been all right. I know. <laughs> um, Thelini here um, says hi from Sri Lanka. This is amazing, the amount of people we oh, have. Here. Um, he says, how, how was your experience filming The Good Karma Hospital in Sri Lanka? Oh, who, who is it that's speaking? Thelini. Thelini. Maybe maybe we bumped into each other. You never know. Um, I had the best time ever. It is such a beautiful, beautiful country. The people are just generous and fun and glorious. It was it was an amazing experience, and I'll never forget it. It was absolutely wonderful. And as a side bonus, um, Kevin was somewhere. Near, no, he wasn't that nearby. But anyway, he had managed to get 12 days off from whatever it was he was doing. He said, I'm going to come and see you. So he flew to Sri Lanka and had, we had 12 days together. And I was working maybe two or three days out of that time. So we had like, and we've never had a holiday in years. So we had this proper holiday. I was, I opted to live on a hotel right on the beach. It was, it was, it was quite um, touristy, but it was absolutely blissful. 
I I absolutely loved it, and I'd I'd love to come back and do it all again. I, I can't though because my character was was killed off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds idyllic though. Oh, it's totally idyllic, totally. Um, Eliza asks, and this has had loads of votes as well. Um, is there anything in Mrs. Hughes, back to Downton Abbey here, that you think is relevant to uh, people, women in twenty twenty? Oh well, do you know? I think I think most of it is still relevant. But yes, Mrs. Hughes. Um, yes, I, I, I. Yes, I would like to think she is relevant. She's. She's from a very different age, as we know, and a very certain and different type of women of that age. But I think people would do well to adopt some of it by <clears throat> being firm but fair in matters, you know. Because um, I think she has got a good heart. She can seem a bit snippy, a bit snippy at times. Mm -hmm. But I think that's because she... I suppose it's because she's got a very deep sense of right and wrong, um, which is a very simple thing to say. But I, I think sometimes it's hard to actually focus on things like that, to whatever's happening in the world, for example, what is actually right and what is wrong. There's some things, as far as Mrs Hughes is concerned, she's a bit didactic about that. It would be wrong, right. Maybe there's room for sort of leeway, but I think that's not a bad policy to have. If you know something's right, stick with it. If you know it's wrong, you know, don't. A bit of strength. A bit of strength. Inner strength. Yeah. Um, Amela asks here, and again, this has had lots of votes. Um, is, is it hard to get over auditions that maybe haven't gone your way? You know, you have to learn very, very quickly of a way of dealing with that uh, because it happens, well, it still happens, you know, nowadays. Um, and it's certainly, if, you, if you're young or unless you're terribly lucky and get every job that you audition for, which is highly unusual, um, you will have disappointments and... You just have to say to yourself, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. You, you've got to be, you've just got to be rather, rather like Mrs. Hughes. <laughs> you've just got to say, hey ho, you've got to be philosophical about the whole thing. I know this is going to happen. I know um, there's certain things I would really, really want to do and get, but you have to let it go. You have to, and, and look on to the next thing. You, you can't constantly think if only if only you've got to be forward thinking that's great that's great advice um Eile here asks what is the most valuable piece of advice that you have received from someone else about the acting industry oh well I remember back in the day of drama school I'm talking about you know the 17th century when I was there practically um it was a very long time ago, but one of my tutors gave me a very, which I thought was a very useful piece of advice. I was playing, I can't even remember what the play was, but it was some character where I had to be all upset and crying about something or other. And she asked me to do it again and again. And then what she said, and I thought, oh, I'll remember this. And she said, now, when you're doing this scene, it's because... I think it might have been the three sisters, actually, that we were rehearsing. She said, your main, why you're so upset is because of this, 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 this. She said, and if you don't allow, your, don't allow yourself to feel sorry for this character, because if you feel sorry for her, it doesn't give the audience any room to feel sorry for her. So don't show that. Don't feel sorry for yourself. On the, let the audience do that for you. And I thought, oh, well, that's quite good. That's good. But, that yeah, it is good. Yeah, no. it's, I suppose like self-indulgence maybe. I don't know. But yes, you've got to think through the character. Maybe if it's a self-indulgent character feeling sorry for themselves, then fair enough. But <laughs> anyway. 
Look, we're, we're running low on time. Should we see how many we can rattle through? Yeah, Ooh, I'll try and be quick. Quick fire. Um, Melanie asks, if your life was made into a movie, who would portray you? Oh, my goodness. Oh, well, let's see Keira Knightley, since I mentioned her before. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Ashley would like to know, have you lived anywhere other than London and Scotland? Uh, no. Fantastic. Um, what profession would you have pursued if you hadn't become an actor? Oh, I might have liked to have become a vet. <laughs> Inspired by your show that you're narrating. <laughs> well, I did have a cousin at the time who, who was a vet and used to have all sick animals all the time. And I, at one toy time in my youth, I thought, oh, I'd love to be a vet. But anyway. Um, if you... Oh, I'm jumping around here. Um, if you could play... it be in any series, film, play, what would it be? Oh, another Downton Abbey movie, please. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, how does it feel, says B, I guess this is to do with Downton Abbey, how does it feel being in such a beautiful place with such lovely costumes and props? Absolutely, what fantastic. That is high clearance. I mean, I spent most of my time in the studio, but I did get to go to the castle on quite a few occasions, and it's stunning. Every time you go, it takes your breath away. Absolutely beautiful. I loved, even though I wasn't wearing the most wonderful clothes. I loved my clothes. They were so beautifully made and so fitting. I loved my outfits. Well, uh, Mella would like to ask if you have a favourite Mrs Hughes outfit. Oh. Well, I suppose I should say her wedding outfit, but that wasn't even hers. It was lent to her. Well, no, it was given to her by Lady Cora. So that was rather nice, but I, I, do, I did have a my evening black evening dresses with lovely it's so exquisitely made one of my black evening because in the daytime I always wore my blue outfit and then at night I would change into my uh, black uniform and one of those I can't remember which one but yeah one of those very good. Stacey would like to know, you've acted in many genres, do you prefer one to another? Is there a genre you'd like to work more in? I'd like to do maybe a bit more comedy. Um, although, having said that, there was a certain amount of comedy in in uh, Downton Abbey. It was quite humorous. Uh, we had a bit of comedy in our play, didn't we? A little bit, absolutely. <laughs> a little bit. We, we got a few laughs, didn't we? Um, even when we weren't meant to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maru would like to know what you missed most during lockdown. Oh, just going out to lovely restaurants and meeting up fr with friends for a drink and just being able to even go on the blooming tube, you know, which I, I never thought I'd hear myself say that, but, yeah, all of it. Um, and Melanie would like to know, are you still nervous when you go on stage? Yes, 100%. Really nervous. I don't know how you get over that, but, yeah. I was going to say, do you have any techniques for dealing with those nerves before you go on? Well, you just have to give yourself a good talking to, but sometimes it works. And, no, it mostly does work, but you, you just know nobody's going to die at the end of it unless I have a heart attack because of my stress. No, um, you know that it's, it's all going to be fine in the end, so you just have to keep telling yourself that. Nobody's going to die. It's all going to be over in a minute. And then it's a bit like when people worry about what people say about them in the press not me I mean I I'm, I'm talking about these other types of celebrities um you know it's going to be wrapping up somebody's chips the next day who gives us stuff you know so yeah don't think too long and hard about it it'll all be over <laughs> fantastic um Marie would like to know do you have any favorite scenes or uh or, or from the series or the film of Downton Abbey oh uh, all the scenes I loved generally were, were the lovely big scenes involving like everybody. When like I remember the first scene at the end of the first series when World War One was declared, and it was at a, a garden fete in the castle grounds, and we were all so there was lots of these wonderful moving shots where they'd pick up one character and then they'd follow them with a cup of tea to sit with somebody else. And we were all involved downstairs, upstairs. We were all involved in that. And, and I love those big grand scenes when we're all there. Uh, have you ever forgotten your lines during a performance and had to improvise? 
<laughs> Callum, maybe you should answer this question for me. <laughs> um, not to my knowledge, Phil. <laughs> You're very discreet, bless your heart. Yes, I have forgotten. <laughs> But fortunately, what you need in that circumstance is a very good and responsible co-actor who will dig you out of that terrible hole. And so I recommend a Callum Finlay to anybody. <laughs> well, I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, that just about concludes episode eight of Chatterbox. But before we wrap up, Phyllis, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to share your lockdown list with us. Some things to keep us creatively stimulated in isolation. What have you got for us? Well, I'm finding that difficult as well. I keep thinking I'm going to clean the house, of course, and then if each day goes by, I think, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. And it takes me about three days to, to clean the bathrooms, <laughs> you know. Um, well, I was thinking, I, I did, you know, I, they, you probably can't do anymore. You know, at Marks and Spencer, they used to give you these little free tubs of seeds. So I, 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 I got wee tubs. Um, and I've repotted them now. I'm hoping they're going to grow into a beetroot, a carrot, some forget-me-nots and some parsley. So I've potted them all up in a big pot. And I'm thinking, what I used to do when I was a student, we all used to go mad for this. Avocados were became a big thing before you could readily get an avocado. So we'd all buy avocados and then stick your two uh, wooden um, toothpicks in either side. Mm -hmm. dip it in a, a mug of water and then it would take root and then you would plant it in a pot and it would become a plant so you can make your own plant so maybe by the end of lockdown you might have a nice avocado plant and it's quite they're quite nice it takes a while but you have to persevere but things like that would be fun that's good i'm going to try the avocado plant um yeah okay, so you stick, the, stick the pointy bit in, so you prop it up in the side of a glass in water with two sticks, uh, cocktail sticks, and then wait for the roots to form. And once it's done that, put it in a little pot. Great. I'm going to do it. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been Aww. so good. It's been fun. Thank you. And a final reminder that the reason we're here is to support the work Playbox Theatre does, the company behind Chatterbox that they do with young people. And they really do need your support, you people out there. Um, <laughs> so please head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash donate and give whatever you can. And I know times are tough, so if you can't donate, don't stress. Instead, find one person you know and like and tell them about Chatterbox Series 2. That's right. We've been awed by your feedback. And so we're taking a couple of weeks off and then we're going to be back with even more exciting guests in the middle of June. So keep your eyes peeled for Chatterbox 2.0. To enjoy the first series again, if you head over to youtube.com forward slash Playbox Theatre where you'll find all our Chatterbox episodes available for free on demand. And if you've enjoyed this episode or indeed any of them in series one, please give us a mention on social media. We are at Playbox Theatre on Twitter and Instagram or facebook.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. And please do post. It really does make a difference. So that's it. Series one is finished. So for Can now, I say bye-bye? Say Can goodbye, I? Phil. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, Phil. And for everybody out there, stay creative and see you in June. Goodbye.